Welcome to knowledgeformen.com, where you're going to grow into the man you want to be. Your life will never be the same again. I can guarantee it. Hey guys, haven't shared it too many times, but one of the biggest epiphanies that I've ever had in my life was the first day that I started reading personal development, entrepreneurship, business books. And the day that I started reading those books, that was the day when my life changed. And ever since then, I've never stopped. So I've compiled the top 30 books and also the top 30 success quotes that every man must live by in a simple guide. You can download it for free at kfmfree.com. Again, that's kfmfree.com to really start growing in every aspect of your life. All right, guys, welcome to the show. I'm here with Dave Asprey, a Silicon Valley investor and entrepreneur, professional biohacker, creator of Bulletproof Coffee, and host of the Bulletproof Radio, a nationally syndicated radio show. And Dave also serves as chairman of the Silicon Valley Health Institute. All right, so quite the bio here, Dave. Happy to have you here. Hey, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. All right, no problem there, Dave. And well, we start off every show with a favorite success quote of the guest, uh, a saying that they've lived by, and then just go ahead and explain why you chose that to the audience. Sure. It's a quote from Andrew Miller, or sorry, <laughs> a quote from Henry Miller. I just got his name wrong, which is because <laughs> I've only had two shots of espresso in my Bulletproof Coffee, not three this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> At least that's what, I'll, that's what I'll say I'm sticking to. And I didn't take my smart drugs yet. So the quote, though, is, the goal of life is not to accumulate power, but to radiate it. And the reason that that's interesting is that early in my career, I was pretty darn successful. I made $6 million when I was 26 in Silicon Valley at the company that was one of the very first cloud computing companies like to launch a modern cloud computing service back in the late 90s. So I spent a lot of time around a lot of very wealthy people and and some of my my coaching clients and, and all have been inordinately successful. So I look at that and I look at how I used to interact with money and I look at how I interact with it now and it used to be about like how do I have more, how do I get more and you know, what do you do with all this money and the power that comes with it and what I ask myself now is like, all right, you know, the, the power isn't from the money, the power is internal. And, you know, what, what do you do with it? And money is there, you know, to help other people. And so it's, it's changed my whole way of thinking about it, where it's not about what do you get, but it's what do you give. And when you do that, everything gets easier. And that's something that I think is missing when you're in that, you know, what, what's in it for me perspective. I think that's really key. And I think really like equally important would be making sure that when you give, you know, you're not giving because you hope that you're going to get something back. Like you're just like genuinely giving value because you want to give value and you're expecting nothing in return. I think that's the best kind of giving. Uh, it's, it's funny. The way I'm launching the Bulletproof Diet book is an example of that principle. There's a, a launch model where successful authors who hit the New York Times list, they pre-purchase a bunch of books and so they're actually owned by the author. And then the author makes an offer that says, oh, I'll send you a book for the cost of shipping and handling. But at the same time, then they also uh, look to sell you like some video courses and a bunch of other stuff. And their assumption is if they give away 100 books for cost of shipping and handling, that you know a couple hundred of those people, or sorry, a couple, hundred, a couple percent of those people will then purchase a much more expensive video program. And that when they add up all the money, they at least broke even. And then with that model, you go to all of your other friends who have web pages and whatnot, and you say, hey, would you send something out to your list? And then you might make some money. You might, you might make a few thousand dollars if some of your followers buy my video program, I'll share the money with you. So this is like how books are launched. And what I did on the Bulletproof Radio is we're pushing up on almost 200 episodes now. We're like in the 180s, I think. And I've helped a lot of people launch their books and I've never expected anything back. Like it, it wasn't, you know, Hey, I want you on the show so I can, so you'll owe me. It was, I just want you on the show because you're talking about something interesting that I think people would care about and I care about. So let's just do it. That means from my book launch, I emailed all the people and I said, Hey, would you be up for helping? But I'm not doing some sort of like upsell where you're going to get revenue. I just think your list would care and I'll give your list some free stuff. It was a huge risk because the proven model is to actually incent them financially and there were some really big names who said, yeah, we're going to tell our audiences about this because like, we know where you're coming from. We know what you're doing. Our audiences care. You're giving away some cool free stuff. 
So that whole mindset around you know, pay it forward, but don't expect a transaction when you pay it forward. It's a, a part of how the Bulletproof Diet, I believe, is going to hit the New York Times list. And I'm, I'm looking at the top spot on the list. So it's it's because of this sincere, hey, I'm just going to help you out. And I asked for help and some people said yes. And a couple of people, surprisingly, ones I wouldn't have expected said no. And I'm like, all right, then don't help. But that's OK. Right. You know. Yeah, yeah. I, I recently just like purchased, I think, two of those books actually, where it was uh, free shipping, and then you get the book, uh, and then and then immediately after you buy the book, they make several offers for some sort of program. So, I've supported I've supported friends who are launching books that way, and there's nothing inherently wrong with it. And in fact, if you think about it, you're like, well, all right, I wanted to make sure that I hit the list, so you know, I let's say, okay, so I'm going to buy you know ten or twenty or thirty thousand copies of my book, and there are wealthy people who do that kind of thing. You know, that that's a huge amount of money. So they spend a half a million dollars to make sure that they get on the list. And then like, what do I do with the books? Well, that giveaway program, it's a proven model. And when someone sends an email to their list, that person might make five or $10,000, which is a lot of money. But at the same time, you know, if everyone on the list gets, you know, aggressively sold to and all of that, if the reason you sent to your list was because you might make five or $10,000, that's okay. Like then your business model is sort of, you know, getting people to listen to you and then sending them a bunch of things. But there's a lot of people who, you know, their business model is, I'm going to send out a lot of really good content. I'm genuinely helping people. And those people are going to buy some of my stuff when they want, but it's less of a pushy thing. And I, I just felt like that was the, the model that was right for me. Yeah, I like that. And Dave, uh, just real quick, uh, when I was doing research on you, I read somewhere that you were the first person to sell something online. Yep. <laughs> yeah, can you elaborate on that? Well, back in the early days of the internet, you uh, you actually knew every website there was. <laughs> that may sound a little bit ridiculous, but I went through a period in when I was maybe 24 where I was extremely stressed because I knew everything happening on the internet. And we went through this hockey stick curve and I was like not sleeping enough because like, there's even more content to read. Ah, So I was selling before there was a web browser. So what I did is back on something called Usenet, I was in college, they raised my tuition. I used to think it was by 1500%, but I went back and I checked the numbers. It only went up by 900% when I was at UC Santa Barbara at the time I was there. Only 900, not too bad. Yeah. So, is that one year or one semester? Uh, that was probably over the course of the four years I was there. All right, okay. But it was still enough that that what I thought was going to pay for my school wasn't, and I was you know, paying my way, so I started a company because also I worked at Baskin Robbins, the 31 flavors ice cream company. And uh, that just wasn't enough. So my little company made a t-shirt that said caffeine, my drug of choice. And it had a picture of the caffeine molecule. You can still buy that shirt today. There's dozens and dozens of knockoffs of it. Like I invented that shirt and it was called alt.drugs.caffeine. And I was written up in the Miami Herald and the only other people who might have have done e-commerce at the same time would be the guys who eventually started wine.com. They were called virtual vineyards back then. So I think that they started selling the day after I started selling. That's my recollection. But if they wanted to hold up their hand and say, no, we were first, I'd be like, I'm pretty sure that we were there like the same week. But other than that, I, I mean, I became, quote, famous for this. My fat picture when I weighed like 280 pounds or something was published in Entrepreneur Magazine before I was 25. And it was because, you know, look at look at this guy making money on this interweb thing. And it, was, it wasn't a great fortune by a long shot. You know, it was enough to pay my tuition. But I later became an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, which is how I made $6 million, which I then lost two years later when the company went bankrupt. So it's not like I'm some rich guy. You know, I, I've, I've been the sole breadwinner for, you know, a long time in my family. And I've worked many jobs in Silicon Valley and I've been successful as well, but I've been working for a living like everyone else. Yeah. You know, just continue on with your story because I'm really interested in how you got started with what you do with biohacking, being an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and how, you know, you got your own show now and, and, and you've been doing that for a while, but go ahead and take the mic. So I, I, here I am, I'm, I'm 26. I've just made $6 million and my career is growing very rapidly. The, the company that that helped with all that success was called Exodus Communications. They're the company where Google's first servers were installed. Hotmail's servers, Yahoo's servers, eBay servers, like all of these, these big companies were coming to us to use our data centers. It was, it was a fundamental part of it. 
of what's happening. Even today, we're talking over the internet and we're going over some of the network infrastructure and physical infrastructure that my company helped to build. And it's remarkable. So problem was I started to get brain fog. I'm fat. My body hurts all the time. And some days I don't have enough brain energy to bring it. Like I can't remember things. I'm sitting in a room. I can't think of a word. And I really was feeling awful. And I went to the doctor and he said, something's wrong. And he said, well, maybe it's blood sugar. So I bought a blood sugar meter, you know, 15 years ago and stabbing my fingers all the time. I'm like, no, that's not it. And he said, well, maybe you should lose some weight. And I'm like, maybe you should go screw yourself, buddy. I've been working out six days a week, an hour and a half a day, right? 45 minutes of cardio, 45 minutes of weights. I cut my calories, cut my fat. And you know what? I'm still fat. So tell me to eat healthy. What does that mean? And of course he didn't have an answer. Um, then he said, vitamin C would kill me. No joke. <laughs> and I fired him on the spot when he didn't know who Linus Pauling was, the guy who was a double Nobel laureate who took 90 grams of vitamin C a day. So I realized at the time, my perspective was that no one was going to help me turn my brain back on or actually solve this weight problem. So I would do it. And I just poured myself into research. And it sort of helps that my educational background is decision support systems, which is a subset of artificial intelligence. And it's how do you make a decision without knowing all the pieces? <laughs> how do you build a system to help you make better decisions? So I applied that kind of thinking as well as the computer hacker kind of thinking. You know, I, I worked in tech. In fact, my most recent job, I, I quit my technology career in January of this year. I was a vice president of cloud security at a big internet company. So I think like a hacker, I always have. I decided to hack my own my own brain and then my own body. I started out by ordering every smart drug known to man in a big box from Europe in the mid to late 90s. And this turned my brain back on enough that my career continued and I had enough energy to solve the rest of the stuff going on with me. I did lose 100 pounds uh, and I've kept 100 pounds of fat off for a decade or so now. Is that with uh, just supplements and the drugs or is there a workout regimen you're practicing right now? You know, I used to work out quite a lot. And during the course of the last 15 years, I've been a raw vegan. I've done Atkins. I've done a raw omnivorous diet where I'd eat like carpaccio and sushi. I've experimented with a, a great number of diets, zone diet. Uh, I've been a vegetarian uh, for about six months to a year, somewhere in that in that time frame. And looked at what these do, but more importantly, I've studied the science behind them and looked at, well, what do you do if the goal is not to make my food taste good or most diets, like how do you eat less calories? <laughs> well, I hate to tell you, when you eat less calories, you have less energy because yeah. calories translate into energy. It turns out, well, what calories you eat matter dramatically and what other things are in your food that aren't calories that are either helping you or harming you. And throughout that time, you know, I, I built a program to restore fertility for my wife and I so we could have two kids at age 39 and 42 for my wife, which is pretty amazing because she was infertile when I met her. And there's so much you can do by changing environmental inputs that I, I became a biohacker. And the idea of biohacking is that you can change the environment around you and inside of you to get control of your biology, you know, to make your body do what you want it to do. And when you do that, you realize you have great power because, well, you can do something as simple as turn the temperature up or down or change the light. You've changed the the environment and your body will respond without your conscious knowledge or, or awareness even. But we have so much science, big data and the internet and search engines make it so easy to say, well, wait, I wonder what would happen. Oh, look, there's 15 studies that say that different light spectrums affect how you function. And you might meet someone like uh, Helen Erlin, who, who I've become friends with, who has for 35 years been studying the effect of different colors of light in your visual field and what they do to your brain. And she's figured out that 48% of people are made weak by certain colors and they're different colors for different people. So you might have seen me wearing like an orange colored glasses. That's because when I wear those, especially under fluorescent lights, I have twice as much energy, like all day long. It's amazing because my eyes are made weak by fluorescent lights. and I'm not alone there. So little things like that, suddenly like I have control. And then you can apply this technology to increasing intelligence. And this is stuff that would have been impossible 50 years ago because we just didn't have signal processing. So you can do things that would take a lifetime of meditation now. And meditation is slow because you don't have any feedback. You just kind of sit there and like, well, guess this last week of sitting you know, in a cave 
you know, I noticed it was, I felt sparkly at the end, so I must have done it right. Like it's very poor feedback. And the kind of things that I do now, I, with some of my, my clients, I do a program called 40 Years of Zen, which is a seven day intensive neurofeedback program where there's electrodes glued to your head. I spent seven weeks of my life doing that. But 50 times a second, there's a computer telling you if you're meditating wrong and it's acting as a lie detector. So if you're telling yourself something that's not true, you'll know it. And I've thrown up and I've cried and so is almost everyone who's been through it because it's so incredibly intense to do a lifetime of meditation in seven days. But you could never do this in all of history. And this is one of those things. That's looking at the software layer in your brain. That's hackable. But doing that doesn't make any sense until you get your basic biology working. And that's why I wrote The Bulletproof Diet because getting enough energy in your brain is terribly important to being a human. In the book, I write about some of the neuroscience and brain biochemistry, and it turns out that when you don't have enough energy in the brain, that your prefrontal cortex, which consumes the most energy, it has the most mitochondrial density, and mitochondria are the power plants in your cells. Well, when your PFC, the prefrontal cortex, doesn't have that, that's the part of your brain that's responsible for kind of being rational and making you human, modulating those mammal impulses that we all have. And that really matters. So if energy goes down, your PFC doesn't necessarily have energy to help you have emotional regularity. And it's important that you have emotional regularity. If you think about what happens inside your brain, there's the model, in fact, that I use in the Bulletproof Diet book is the Labrador Retriever, those big floppy dogs. If you imagine one of those dogs, the it has three big behaviors. The first one is like you throw a stick and it drops what it's doing and it goes, look, and it runs away. So easy distractibility. And part of that comes from you know a desire to pursue things and, and also just from uh, constantly looking around for something to be afraid of. Like, is there a tiger that's going to eat me? It's a core part of surviving. And we have that. The meat of your body, if you did not have a human part of your brain, would still be watching out for predators. It's built into your brain. And it's not built into the human parts of your brain. It's built into like the operating system that supports your meat. And the next thing that the Labrador will do is, oh, look, there's some spoiled food in the gutter. I think I'll eat that. Now, the fact that dog will be throwing up two hours later isn't really part of, part of its worldview because it doesn't think about it. It has a basic program that says, eat, you might starve. Eat so you don't die. All right, we have that. And that's a huge impact on your willpower. And the third thing that the Labrador Retriever will do is, oh, look, there's a leg. I think I'll go hump it. And that's species survival stuff that's wired into our meat. So if you had no prefrontal cortex to speak of and you only followed those three rules, run away from things that might eat me, eat whatever you can find, and make sure you have sex, we could reproduce the species. So we have those built in without having to think about them. And that's what gets us in the most trouble. What we do is we apply willpower using our prefrontal cortex and we then receive these primal urges from the body and we can decide what to do. We can say yes or we can say no. But every time we decide, we're taking up a decision and those decisions cost us something. In the book, I also write about decision fatigue. This is something that was only recently discovered in the realm of psychology and psychiatry. And they measured it and found that people only have so many decisions in them before they run out of energy. And that every decision you make, big or small, costs you something. That means that later in the day, you probably make worse decisions than earlier in the day, unless you're managing your decision load so you don't have too much decision fatigue. The most wasteful decision ever known to man is a conversation in your head that looks like this. You had a, a bagel for breakfast. Two hours later, you're of course going to be hungry because bagels don't really stick with you. So you're sitting in a conference room and someone sets out a plate of cookies. Even though it's 10 a.m., people do that. And now you're in a meeting and the Labrador in your head says, eat the cookie. And you make a decision, no. Well, the Labrador in your head is like any Labrador and it instantly looks at you again and says, no, eat the cookie. And you say, no. And then you go through this, this conversation where every one or two seconds, the Labrador says, eat the cookie, and you say no. Well, every time you say no, you're taking away from the rest of your day. And pretty soon, a half hour, an hour later, you sort of give up in disgust and say, well, I guess I'll just eat half the cookie. And then afterwards, you sort of like, that cookie wasn't even very good. Why did I just eat that? You ate that because your own body 
took up all of your decisions and it made you make a bad decision and it wasted decisions that you could have used to buy another company, to be kind to your kids or anything else. So as rational human beings, it's our duty to eat in such a way that the Labrador in our head is not starving and doesn't pester us all day long so we can make better decisions and be better people. That's why the Bulletproof Diet is about high performance. It's about extending willpower. And when people have Bulletproof Coffee, which is sort of one of the, the flagships of the book because it's so effective, and we'll talk about what that is in a minute, but when they drink that, it is designed to really turn off hunger and food cravings. So people who deal with food cravings all day long, who are just spending willpower wantonly, suddenly it's like silence in their head. They're like, wait a minute, I didn't care about food today. Like I had this for breakfast and I didn't care if I had lunch or didn't have lunch. Like remarkable. And it's that level of clarity and focus you can have when the body stops complaining about stuff. So are you replacing breakfast and lunch with just the Bulletproof coffee? There are three models on the Bulletproof diet. In fact, I'll tell people, someone who's listening right now, if you're on your mobile phone, I'll give you the, the main stuff in the book for free. You can text 58885. Just text BP diet in your email address and I'll send you the poster you can print out and put on your fridge that tells you everything that I'm going to say. So this is the uh, Bulletproof Diet Roadmap? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. So yeah, walk us through it. So the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap is, it, it took actually months to put this thing together. And what it tells you is what to eat when, and there's three different models. One of them is just the simple diet where, yeah, you can have breakfast, but have the right foods for breakfast. And that is protein, and most importantly, fat for breakfast. But what I do and what many people on the Bulletproof Diet do is called Bulletproof Intermittent Fasting. And intermittent fasting has been popular for the past couple of years in mostly like paleo and CrossFit circles. And it's the idea that if you have dinner, you just don't eat for 18 hours after dinner. So you skip breakfast and have a late lunch, and it does great things to your biology. Like you lose weight, uh, you maintain muscle mass, you get a lot of focus. The problem is that for most people like me who have jobs and kids, you run into a problem. Around 11 a.m., you start getting cold and tired and hungry, and you get really cranky. Well, if you have a job and, and employees or, or managers uh, who you report to, and you're kind of feeling unfocused and cranky because you're making yourself use your willpower to wait another three or four hours to eat, it doesn't always lead to like a feeling of peace <laughs> or uh, to the optimal performance, but you might look good. So I came up with Bulletproof Intermittent Fasting, and that's the idea of using Bulletproof Coffee, which is coffee, and in this case, it needs to be mold-free coffee. I make one, which is the most extensively tested coffee on the planet, and on the Bulletproof blog, I write about how you can at least lower the odds of getting mold in coffee. In North America, we have a problem there are no government regulations about how much mold toxin is allowed in our coffee, but there are regulations in Europe and in Asia. So some of the world's worst coffee comes here, and you can tell you've had that because if coffee makes you feel cranky or jittery or you drink coffee, you're good for two hours, and then two hours later, you sort of feel blah, and you, you want sugar, and you want another cup of coffee, that's the crash caused by toxins in coffee. Good coffee, stuff that doesn't have mold in it from coffee processing, doesn't cause a crash the same way that most coffee does. So I've, I've had hundreds of people say, I can't drink coffee. And then they drink my lab tested coffee and they, they're fine. So the quality there is terribly important. So the average cup of coffee in America, like let's say a Starbucks or like a, another mainstream coffee retailer, you know, where does that stand on, on the level of, of good or, or bad coffee? I've published about 30 studies on the Bulletproof site about coffee and toxins. And depending on what levels you're looking for, depending on what lab tests you're using, the largest number said 93% of coffee had these mold toxins in them. Another study says 70, another study says 50. Roasting can kill mold, but it doesn't destroy the poison that was put there by the mold during the coffee fermentation process. So it's kind of complex chemistry, but it's very well documented on the site. And the problem is you just don't know. It's, it's possible to get at a high-end coffee shop single estate washed coffee is going to be better tasting and more expensive and it's going to have a lower percentage likelihood of toxins but it probably still has some in it unless they modified their coffee processing when they were fermenting the coffee beans so this is going to be interesting for all the listeners and even myself 
you know, how should I order a coffee to ensure that I'm getting the best possible coffee they have inside of that coffee shop? You should say, I want a washed single estate coffee. And washed means that the beans were processed in a way that creates less toxins than the natural process. And single estate means it came from just one place. What all the big coffee chains do is they make blends. And with a blend, you might get beans from four different, say maybe three different locations on the planet, but from 50 different plantations there. And each one has a different fungal biome. They're each processed differently. And so the odds of you getting enough toxin to take that edge off your mental performance is, is pretty good. So what you want to do is just get it from one place, and then either you're going to get toxins or you're not. The reason I created upgraded coffee beans, and I, I do all this lab testing and developed the standards for that, is that I was going around following my own advice, single estate, washed coffee, and I would throw out half the coffee I would buy. I'd, you know, I'd buy a pound of this really good fresh roasted, s smells great, and i drink it. I'm like, oh, look, there we go. I've got jitter. Uh, I've got this sort of just crushing food cravings, and I'm tired. I, I drink it. I feel good, and then I crash. When I get coffee right, when I do the lab tests and stuff, I drink coffee, and I don't crash. I just feel like myself all day, and it's such a difference that we were able to measure that, and I published the data from a group of people. This was an institutional review board approved study of cognitive function testing my lab tested upgraded coffee beans versus a selection of coffee beans from local coffee shops. And we found statistically significant improvements in cognitive performance on six of seven measures. So these toxins affect you even if you don't have as extreme of a response as I do. So that's one ingredient in Bulletproof Coffee is mold-free coffee beans. And you would ask those two questions to at least minimize your chances, but you, you still have a pretty good chance of getting some, some mold in there. You'll just get less mold if you go with that washed single estate. All right, so let's say I'm drinking a Bulletproof Coffee right now. How am I going to feel and how is this going to differ from the traditional coffees that we're all accustomed to? Well, Bulletproof Coffee, for listeners who haven't heard of it, they need to know the other two ingredients, and I'll tell you how you feel on it. The first one is mold-free beans. Second one is instead of milk or cream or half and half, you use grass-fed unsalted butter, and you blend it into the coffee. It's important that you blend it. It's important that it be butter, not cream, because cream and milk have protein that binds to the antioxidants in the coffee, so you don't get the benefits of coffee antioxidants. Coffee is the number one source of antioxidants in the U.S. diet. And the third ingredient is something called brain octane oil. This is an 18 times extract of coconut oil. It's the shortest chain fat in coconut oil. And what it does, it has no flavor. It's a clear liquid oil. But when you take it, it most quickly goes to ketones in the body. It basically gives you the energy like you're in ketosis without using any carbohydrate, without using liver enzymes or anything in order to digest your fats. So all of a sudden, you get this boost of energy and mental clarity that comes from brain octane. You get the stimulation from the caffeine and the other things that are in the coffee. And you get amazing effects from the butter on inflammation and from the coffee oils if you brew the coffee with a French press or espresso, as I recommend. So basically, it sounds really complex, but here's the deal. Make a French press full of mold-free coffee, and you can buy mold-free beans on the Bulletproof website, or you can follow the advice that I'm talking about here, and you can get at least less mold. And from there, you add a tablespoon or two of grass-fed butter. Don't worry, it doesn't taste gross. And then you add a tablespoon or two of brain octane oil, and you hit blend on your blender. And when you do that, what comes out is this incredibly creamy, delicious latte thing. And you're like, okay, it sounds a bit weird. You take one drink, and you're done. In fact, I'm so sure that people say, all right, I want more of this. I'm opening the first Bulletproof coffee shop in Santa Monica in a couple months. And the reason is that in the last several years when I've really been talking about this, and I've been developing this recipe since 2004 when I came back from Tibet, having had yak butter tea and noticed that it changed my brain. I was like, all right, I just want people to try it. So I'm making a coffee shop so people who've never heard of this can come in. They'll try it once and realize they can take it home. And what you feel like is amazing focus and energy, complete lack of food cravings, and lunch will come, and it is not uncommon to forget to eat lunch because you're just not hungry. You just don't care about it. And maybe like two o'clock comes around, and you're like, oh yeah, I could eat. But it's very different to say, I could eat, like it's about time to eat, versus what most people identify as hunger, which is, if I don't eat something right now, I'm gonna kill someone, I'm, I'm starting to crash, like I have to eat now. And it's a feeling of urgency. Healthy 
animals, healthy people don't have that level of urgency unless they've been fasting for several days. If you feel an urgent need to eat, it's because you did something wrong earlier that day in another meal. So it's kind of shocking, but you can control your environment so that hunger no longer runs your life. Yeah, it also tastes really good. You know, I think the grass-fed butter really adds some flavor to it, like like a latte. So, you know, just for people listening and, and you know, like what's the importance of grass-fed butter versus regular butter? Like why can't I just go to the store and put the cheapest butter I find there to save money and, and get that result? When you feed a cow soy and corn and grain, the cow makes very different fats in the butter and you get a low quality butter that doesn't have all the nutrients. You wanna maximize the amount of butyric acid and very specifically a compound called conjugated linoleic acid or CLA. CLA is associated with a reduction in inflammation and with weight loss. You also get more vitamins A, vitamins E and vitamins D and very, very importantly, vitamin K2 when you get grass-fed beef, or sorry, grass-fed beef or grass-fed dairy. The problem is that when you have the normal industrial butter, you're not getting any of that stuff. And vitamin K2 has profound effects on your health, including a reduction in cavities. And its job is to make sure that calcium stays in the bones instead of coming out of the bones. And vitamin K2 works with vitamin D3. So if you're taking D3 and you're not taking K2 or eating a substantial amount of butter, you're not getting these benefits. Butter also from grass-fed cows when it's cultured contains more butyric acid, which is a short chain fat. And butyric acid is associated with improvements in upper gut function as well as a reduction in inflammation in the brain. I hate to tell you if you're listening to this right now, but you have some brain inflammation going on if you're like the vast majority of people. The less inflammation you have in the brain, the better you're thinking, the faster it'll be. So one of the ways that you increase human performance is by increasing energy in the brain and decreasing inflammation. And the whole Bulletproof Diet is designed around doing those things. And the fact that you can lose weight and you feel good on it, like the losing weight part isn't the main goal. I, I'm married, I have kids. If I have an extra 10 or 20 pounds, it's not gonna change my life. I, I don't need to look like you know 4% body fat movie star. In fact, it's not even a healthy look if you wanna live a long time. But it's possible to look like that and there are some pro athletes and movie stars who use the Bulletproof Diet to get like that. So it's something though where the most precious thing you can get is effortless focus and the ability to just bring it from an energy perspective. So it's the end of the day, you've been working hard all day and an emergency meeting happens, instead of sort of being a zombie, to be the guy who stands up and says, all right, we're gonna handle this and to do it without just draining everything you have. So I have more energy now than I've ever had in my life and I have Bulletproof coffee for breakfast. So it, it sounds amazing, but when I travel, same thing. I carry a stick of butter and some brain octane oil and my own coffee beans, and I brew it in my hotel room. I save time on breakfast, and I just don't care about lunch. And if you've ever traveled for business, you know that sometimes you get lunch, sometimes you don't, it's usually really crappy. I have stable, amazing energy when I travel, and I do that quite a lot. I didn't have that until I got on top of what I was putting in my body, and Bulletproof Coffee is it's at the beginning of the day every day. Yeah, you, know, you definitely have to pay attention to what goes inside your body, and Bulletproof Coffee not only tastes great, but it seems to have the, the nutrients that your body needs. So uh, I want to move into the topic of nootropics and supplements now. Uh, you mentioned you spent over, or maybe I read this, but it was over $300,000 on experiments on yourself. And you also mentioned that these drugs came from Europe in, in the 90s. So I'm wondering, is it any different today to buy drugs from Europe or, or uh, these type of nootropics, these special drugs, smart drugs, so to speak, um, any more restrictions today than back in the 90s? Um, there was no more or less regulation on drugs. To this day, it's totally legal for you to buy a three-month supply of just about any drug that's not like a scheduled substance as long as it's you have a prescription, even from a doctor in anywhere else on the planet can write the prescription, you can bring it in. There's no law against that. And in fact, by law, they're required to allow you to do it. So it's totally okay for you to order modafinil uh, from India or Canada and have it shipped to your house. You're not breaking the law when you do that. As long as a physician at the company selling you the drug wrote a little prescription that they have on file and their location. So a lot of people sort of feel like it's illicit. It's not. You have a right to buy the chemicals that are going to improve your health or your performance. It's your body. And it's it, I consider it unethical for some entity to say, oh, no, you're not allowed to use that one without a permission slip. Sorry. 
it's your body and if you want to do something that's going to help your inflammation and someone else disagrees with your strategy, it's good that they disagree. You might want to listen to them if they're well educated and have a lab coat, but it's your body at the end of the day. So most of the major breakthroughs in biohacking and in medicine shockingly come from people who are doing something different than what everyone else does. So there's great pressure to not innovate because innovation would be doing something different, which might be risky. So it is, uh, it, it is a, a good idea to listen to experts like that, but you can get those drugs legally and ethically from overseas. And now many of them you can actually just buy in the US online because there's no law against selling them. Others that are like modafinil that are prescription drugs require a prescription. You have to buy those from outside the country or you have to have a physician prescribe them. So, so what I did when my brain was, was not working well and my career was going great, but I was just barely hanging on, is I ordered this big box with sort of one of every smart drug that, that was written about at the time. I followed the advice of a guy named Steve Folks, And Steve wrote a book called Smart Drugs and Nutrients Too. Uh, in fact, I've become good friends with Steve. He's an advisor to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. I didn't know him at the time. I just read everything he ever wrote, and I ordered every drug that he wrote about that had evidence for improving cognitive function. And I had really good results. It brought my brain back enough that I could continue growing my career, and I had enough energy and focus to start hacking my biology to figure out why I was fat despite stuff that was supposed to work but didn't, and why my brain was turning off. Because the last thing you want to do is, you remember like in seventh grade, at least for me, people say, ah, you're fat and you're stupid. Like, I'm 26. I'm kind of feeling fat and stupid because I'm still fat and I'm feeling stupid. So I really was motivated. And that whole path of taking smart drugs gave me enough of, of an upside that I could figure out what was going on with me biologically and I could increase my cellular energy. It, it turns out the mitochondria in my body had very likely been damaged. I'd been exposed to a water damaged building. And when you have an environmental exposure to toxic mold, it causes autoimmunity, it causes brain fog, it causes fatigue, and a bunch of other things. I also had Lyme disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and a bunch of other things like that diagnosed. But I think the root cause there was, was likely an interaction between my genes and between environmental toxins. In fact, it's such a well-documented thing that I just finished filming a movie about that, a documentary with some of the top physicians in the country who work on these problems because 100 million people in the U.S. have the genes that make them permanently disabled after living in a water-damaged building. And the rest of us just get heart disease and cancer over time, but it doesn't cause that chronic fatigue thing. So we have a big problem with building construction, and we've changed the soil in our planet so that it makes more aggressive types of fungus than we used to deal with. So things like that, I would have never known this had I not become a biohacker. And now that I understand that, I am far more resilient than I've ever been, even as a young man. I don't get sinus infections. I don't get strep throat. My body doesn't hurt all the time. And my brain works with just an effortless ease that I've never experienced because I understand all the different environmental variables that are responsible for controlling how my body and brain work. The Bulletproof Diet book is about taking the most important of those environmental variables, which is your food, and upgrading your food so that you can just make better choices. I don't tell you, never eat this, don't do that. The reason it's a roadmap is that you can choose where you want to drive. You want to be in a, a sketchy neighborhood, or do you want to go through you know, the high performance zone? And there's three kinds of food on the Bulletproof Diet. One of them is bulletproof foods. These are foods that have the most nutrition, the right macronutrients, and they don't cause a lot of inflammation. There's suspect foods that for huge numbers of people cause problems. And they're suspects because you have no idea whether they cause problems for you or not. And then at the very bottom of the infographic, there are kryptonite foods. And these are foods that no one should eat unless they're going to starve to death. Like they do not help your health. They do not help your performance. There's no rational reason to put these in your body because there are better choices. And what are some examples of those kryptonite foods? Gluten and wheat. Wheat is bad, like wheat bread is bad for you. Wheat bread, yep. And I I was under the impression that wheat bread is a better alternative to white bread. No. In fact, it's probably worse. So then is it multigrain bread, which is the one that's good for you? No. Your option is to eat rice bread. That would be the only one I would touch. Because when you're eating the other grains there, you're getting the the toxins that form in the lining of the grain itself, because it's kind of amazing, but if you are a stalk of wheat, your goal is not to be eaten, your goal is to reproduce. 
So you cover your seeds with things that make animals not want to eat them. And it turns out that wheat is pretty good at doing that. So the outer husk of the wheat has lectins in it that are not present in the middle. And also we've engineered wheat to have a lot of gluten in it. And gluten triggers autoimmunity on many different levels. Autoimmunity means your immune system attacks parts of your body. So things like lupus, when you eat wheat, you can have lupus happening 10 or 20 years later. In fact, I interviewed Dr. Tom O'Brien, who's one of the, the top experts on gluten and what it does to your immune system. And he talked about a study where they took blood from people in the military and they bank it. And they went through and they looked at blood from 20 and 30 years ago. And they found that using modern technologies, they could find and predict whether people were going to get lupus about 20 to 30 years before it actually happened because their diet, which contained gluten, was triggering these autoimmune behaviors, but you don't see symptoms for a long time. So there's a ton of evidence that says none of us should be eating gluten as a high performance food. Some people tolerate it much better than others, but tolerating food versus eating food that makes you kick ass is a very big gap. So that's one of the kryptonite foods. And so is margarine and artificial sweeteners and flavor enhancers like MSG. Soy is on that list of kryptonite foods. Soy inhibits thyroid function and it changes your estrogen levels. It lowers testosterone, it makes your testes smaller, and most of it is genetically modified, which has its own set of autoimmune risks that don't come in unmodified soy. The oil in soy is also an inflammatory, unstable oil. So there's a really good case that says if you're dying and you need some food and all you have is you know a soy loaf burger, then you should eat it. But if you want to perform at your optimal and you want to live a long time, then it's just not a good food choice. So on the roadmap, soy is on the roadmap. For every day for the rest of your life, you are on the Bulletproof diet. You just choose where on the roadmap you're going to be. And things at the very top of it are grass-fed steak, salmon, butter, coconut oil, lots of veggies. But surprisingly, some veggies trigger autoimmunity in people. And you may be one of the 20% of people who gets ar rheumatoid arthritis caused by eating tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and other members of the nightshade family. So what I recommend people do on the Bulletproof Diet in the book is you can just get this roadmap. It's a one-page document that goes on your fridge. And then you eat at the top of the Bulletproof Diet. This is the most Bulletproof foods. And when you do that, you eliminate all the suspect foods all at once. And when you do that, what most people experience is a profound improvement in how they think and how they feel. They get a little bit thinner. You can lose even a pound a day sometimes, depending on your gut biome, depending on, on other variables, like how much weight you have to lose. And you're like, wow, I, I'm really feeling good. And then you say, all right, I'm going to just test myself. I'll have pizza. Get some gluten. Get some dairy. Get some tomatoes. Like, Get all the toppings. What the heck? And you're going to feel like, like a truck hit you. And then you're like, okay, there was some of those suspect foods that were in that pizza. I think I need to track down what those are because I don't want to feel this way anymore. I just got used to feeling like a great golden god for the first time in years. Like we're talking big improvements in energy. So that's the process. Then you eliminate the suspect foods and you may realize, you know, I'm one of those people who does okay on lentils. There's a surprising number of people who eat lentils and they just, their energy goes down and it doesn't come back. And they just... They survive, but they don't thrive. And what this is about is absolutely having energy all day, every day. And you can do that with this style of eating. One page infographic, it's free. In fact, uh, if you didn't get it earlier, just text 58885, text the word BP diet, and then your email address. I will send this thing to you for free. This is the backbone of the book, and I'm not charging for it because I have a selfish need here. I figure when more people eat to turn on their brain, they'll be nicer to each other, and then I get to live in that world. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> so that's why it's free. <laughs> I'd like to live in that world too. Uh, so is it safe to say that people you know, experiencing lack of energy or they have diseases are really causing it themselves by what they put into their bodies? I do believe that many of them are caused by bad foods, but it's more complex than that not getting enough sleep. And I write about how to improve sleep in the book. And it's a big part of the Bulletproof diet, or sorry, the Bulletproof lifestyle on the Bulletproof blog 
is what are the sleep hacks? How do you get more sleep or more quality sleep in less time? And how do you get more exercise in less time? You can actually get the right amount of exercise in much less time. So I cover those things in the Bulletproof Diet with the idea being that you can free up tons, you can create more energy and then free up tons of other energy. So if you're eating well, but you expose yourself to bright lights at night and you don't sleep very well, uh, and then say you're working in a, uh, an environment that's full of toxic chemicals like formaldehyde furniture and all, you may still be tired. So there are environmental things that matter greatly, but very few things matter as much as eating the right types of food that don't contain anti-nutrients. Uh, most people are entirely unaware that when they put something on their plate, they're getting things that give them energy, things that improve their health, and they're also getting things that take away their health. So it's a double-edged sword. And what I do with the Bulletproof Diet is I say, look, we acknowledge it's a double-edged sword. Why don't we get the foods that have the biggest blade that cuts in the right direction and not much of a blade cutting in the wrong direction. And that line of thinking that says, don't eat perfectly, screw that noise. Just make slightly better decisions. So you don't have to eat perfect on the Bulletproof Diet. You're always somewhere on the roadmap. Just try and lean to the side of the roadmap where you want to be and you'll still improve your performance. So perfection is not required. Yeah, I like that. And you know, I'm a fan of the diet. It's a healthy, natural diet. But the one thing I am skeptical about is supplements and smart drugs. In one of my favorite books, uh, by Mastery by Robert Greene, and inside that book, one of the chapters is on self-reliance and how you should always, you should draw your state from within. Everything you need is found within you. So, you know, I want to get your opinion on, you know, what do you feel like the relationship between self-reliance and yeah. supplements and smart drugs lie. I, I love Robert Greene's work. Um, man's an absolute master. Here's the thing. Uh, was the omelet you had for breakfast coming from within? <laughs> All right. Okay. No. What's the difference between supplements and food in your self-reliance model? <laughs> All right. Touche. Touche. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it's, it's a sincere question. I'm not trying to prove you wrong here. I just don't get it. I, uh, I just feel like, you know, the eggs and the spinach omelet, you know, it's from the earth. Like I it wasn't made in some lab. But, but you, you, you cooked it. You cooked it, right? Okay. Did you process something from the earth and put it in your body? Yeah. <laughs> it's from the earth. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> so is everything else. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. I, there's just something about a guy in, in a lab, you know, mixing chemicals and then putting something, you know, that isn't from the earth in your body. Like, like a commercial kitchen. <laughs> all right. All right. You're good with the rebuttals here. You've had this question <laughs> asked many times. <laughs> no. It, I, I'm just, it's, it's not that I'm practiced on that. Um, there are people who say, well, some, some supplements are, are wasted money. And the answer to that is that it is my hope that I have the most expensive urine on the planet. And that means that some of the supplements I took, my body used all it needed and I peed out the rest. And the kind of supplements that I take are not increasing stress on my kidneys and liver because those would be poorly made supplements. So there is an argument that says it's expensive to take supplements, to which the counter argument is it's expensive to go in for open heart surgery or to die. And my goals are to do neither one of those, uh, especially, well, actually either one. They both sound unpleasant. And I fully recognize that I'll die someday, but I would like the life between now and when that happens to be absolutely full of energy and vibrance without a lot of hospital time. And there's abundant evidence that using supplements, especially preventatively when you're younger, is a really good idea. And yeah, it's possible to use the wrong supplements. And we're still learning more things every day about supplements, but there's a preponderance of evidence that intelligent use of some supplements is a really good idea. And it could be as simple as taking turmeric. Like there's a good example for you. Very powerful herb. That means it comes from food. But it's also got a whole bunch of like health effects. Like it thins your blood, it turns off inflammation, it modifies the gut biome. So how do you feel about taking like a capsule of turmeric instead of just dumping it on your food? Yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, I, I would recommend it. Turmeric is an herb that I take. I put it on my food and I take a pill. And it, things like that. I, I'm a huge fan of, of herbal things. I take adaptogenic herbs. And that's another thin line for you. Adaptogens increase human performance. They were first pioneered by the Chinese military like 1,000 plus years ago. What adaptogens do is they let you turn 
on your stress response very quickly and then turn it off quickly. So you take adaptogens, you go into battle, someone's about to kill you, you turn on your stress response, you like cut them in half or do whatever you're gonna do on the battlefield. But then when you're done, you can return back to your normal state without continuing to be in fight or flight mode ready to kill. So this was a military advantage. And I take adaptogens, I've taken them for a dozen years. And I do those because if I want to turn on my stress, it's good to have fast throttle response, be able to turn my stress up and turn it down with more control. And there's some cell membrane permeability reasons you might want to take them. But these are medical herbs. And then you get something like oregano. Oregano is one of the primary spices I use and one of the things you'll find in all the recipes in the Bulletproof Diet book. Maybe not for dessert, though. Oregano-flavored dessert isn't so good. But what oregano does in the body is amazing because it's a profound antimicrobial, particularly antifungal, and it's antiparasitic. So like we're crossing the line between foods and you know, at foods and medical herbs. And let's just take coffee. Like if you do a search for coffee in just about any sort of condition you can think of and you just Google search it, you'll find a PubMed reference that says what the antioxidants in coffee can do for you. And there's a study that I reference in the book that says, oh, look, the bacteria that thin people have more of, they eat coffee polyphenols as fuel. So one of the reasons that Bulletproof Coffee has the effect it does is that the fat in Bulletproof Coffee suppresses bacteria in the gut, and then it feeds the thin people bacteria with the coffee. So basically, you're giving a selective advantage to the bacteria that you want to have more of because turns out thin people have bacteria that help them stay thin. And the bacteria in your gut are actually making a hormone that your liver is supposed to be making, and that hormone forces you to store fat. It's called fasting-induced adipose factor. And there's bacteria that are hacking your system right now as you're listening to this. And when you drink the right thing, in this case, Bulletproof Coffee, you're actually using what the bacteria do to your advantage. The bacteria will tell you to burn more fat when they realize they have no sugar to eat. They're like, oh, we're hungry. Oh, I guess the body should, eat, should burn more fat. This is amazing. But it's also not, not really using a supplement but what if you took a capsule that had the same polyphenols in it that had the same effect? Like the difference for me is is lost. Right. Good point there. Good point there. And and I think, you know, turmeric and oregano, perfectly fine. But what about when we're looking at these smart drugs? When we're looking at these like you know, pharmaceutical pharma type of drugs, like what are your you know thoughts on these? And you know, I'm looking at Amazon here and I just type in nootropics. And there's just a, like a plethora of of all different kinds of smart drugs and nootropics here. Like what are your thoughts on this stuff here? I'm actually upset with Amazon right now because the most, I would say the safest, most studied family of nootropics, the stuff that's been around for 50 years, stuff I've taken every day, just about every day, I occasionally don't, things like aniracetam and paracetam, but the stuff that's a standard part of my high-performance life, those things just got taken off of Amazon. You can still buy them legally in the US, but I don't know rational, what the rationale at Amazon, they never told anyone why, but one day... The companies who sell paracetam were unable to sell it anymore, but they could sell other things that are even less studied than paracetam. So this is an example. It's a drug that increases oxygen in the brain. It makes your the cells in your brain live longer, like the nerves live longer. It's neuroprotective, and it improves mental performance. Aniracetam improves memory I.O., your ability to get things in and out of your memory. And if it's going to help you have a healthier brain, it's not a terribly expensive pharmaceutical, then there's a pretty good argument for taking it. Just as good of an argument as there is for you know eating healthy diet, where like this is a technology that's going to help me be more self-reliant. Because now when I'm in the middle of a situation where I want to be self-reliant, I can pull more out of my memory than I could before. Or I can remember things better. Like like aren't those tools for self-reliance? Yeah, good point. Indeed they are. That's a struggle that I've had too. Like, do I need to be natural? Well, there's no such thing as natural. When you think back, like, I don't know, 100,000 years ago, and if, by the way, if you're like an anthropologist, paleo person, maybe it was 107,000 years, so don't quote me on the length here. <laughs> a long time ago, there were two cavemen, and one of them said, you know, Grok, look, I, I found fire after a lightning storm. I'm going to use it to keep my cave warm. And the other caveman said, you can't do that. It's not natural. I'm like, one of those two cavemen is our ancestor. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. Right? It's technology. It's just technology. The guy who said, I'm going to cook my food. Well, he's also our ancestor. And the guy who ate the food raw got a big worm and died. And he's not our ancestor. Cooking is a fundamental technology that is not natural. But man, it works. So I've decided that I'm going to use the technologies to control my biology, to help my body do what I want it to do, not necessarily what it was designed or evolved to do. Because my body really evolved to fight. And I don't know if I'm allowed to drop an F-bomb here, but I will. You can beat me if you want to. But basically, you want to fight, fuck, and flee. Those are the big things that you do. And that's what all animals do. They're optimized for that. However, I do not want my life to consist of those activities exclusively. So I will do the things that allow me to be more human and allow me to have control of those parts of my nervous system uh, so that I can I can help other people and, and I can achieve the goals I had and, and I can walk around without being ready to do all those things all the time. And I, I think that is a level of self-mastery that that is worth considering, even if it requires me to use an unnatural EEG machine to show myself when my brain is misbehaving and where I have to use an unnatural process to concentrate coconut oil because 18 tablespoons of natural coconut oil would make me throw up, but one tablespoon of brain octane oil just makes me feel great. Like those are things that help me be more of who I am. That's, that's where I'm going with all this. Yeah. You've, you've given me a, a big epiphany here on the way I look at just kind of like health and and different supplements and things like that and diet. So I appreciate that. And I'm sure, you know, many listeners may have had a similar epiphany as well. But now, Dave, let's enter the knowledge round. So are you ready? Uh, sure. If you want to grow to the highest levels that you've ever been at in your life, go to kfmfree.com and you can download the top 30 books and success quotes that every man must live by. Every guy should read. If you want to grow, if you want to achieve greatness in life, you're going to have to read and surround yourself with the greatest minds of the world. So I've done all of the hard work for you. I've read hundreds of books. I've listened to hundreds of audiobooks. I've gone through and found the best quotes that you'll need to succeed and thrive and grow and become the man that you want to be. So go to kfmfree.com and I'll send it to you right now. kfmfree.com. Welcome to the Knowledge Round, where the guests will be asked rapid-fire questions to give the audience invaluable pieces of wisdom to help transform their lives, starting in 3, 2, 1, showtime. All right, and first question here, Dave, is it seems like you're really passionate about the work that you do with biohacking, uh, you know, the, the products that you're coming out with, and supplements, and so, you know, I'd like other people to have that same kind of passion uh, that you have. So, like, what kind of advice would you give to someone who's feeling kind of lost or unsure of what they should do or their purpose? If you're feeling lost and unsure of your purpose, then you need to understand why you're here. And there's this old technology we have. It's called meditation. <laughs> <laughs> you need to start doing that and start growing self-awareness. You can also cheat on meditation. And I would recommend that you start with training your heart rate variability because when you can reduce the sort of the noise in your head and you can learn to consciously do that, things get much better. Yeah, I like that. Something new there. And Dave, what was holding you back from becoming the man you are now today? It is mostly fear. And Fear is not a conscious thing. It's not a rational thing. Fear happens in the nervous system and it makes you do things that are not in your self-interest, but they're things that your body believes will make it survive. So I, I realized that I had all kinds of fear that I was unaware of and becoming aware that my body was responding that way and then learning to be the master of my body to be able to turn that off and to do it consciously and say, oh, was there a, a valuable fear signal? Oh, look, there's a fear signal and there's a tiger. Maybe I should use that fear and run away. That's cool. <laughs> but quite often you're in a meeting and a fear response happens and it's, it's a fear of failure and because your nervous system somehow associates failure with dying. And it doesn't matter that there's no reason for that. Your nervous system is, is dumber than a Labrador retriever. It, it's an automated defense system designed to keep essentially any animal alive. It just doesn't serve you and mine doesn't serve me very well. So being the master of that is like having a well-trained dog versus having a dog that jumps all over the furniture and pees on the floor. Like I don't want my nervous system peeing on my floor. It's my floor. <laughs> all right. And now Dave, can you name a mentor, someone who's helped you on your journey? And can you share a specific moment that was really impactful for you? You know, I'll, I'll go back to when I was maybe, I, I started college when I was 16. I was a little younger than everyone else. And this is at UC Santa Barbara. And there's a guy, I have no idea if he's alive anymore. 
I remember his name to this day because it was a super superhero name and his name was Kent Clark, like Superman's name backwards. So Kent, if you're out there, drop me a line, man. It, this guy was a, a pretty darn successful entrepreneur and he took time to come in and talk to a bunch of basically teenage freshmen in college about entrepreneurial success. And at the time, I was just blown away. I'm like, why would a guy with this amount of money and success have any interest in talking to me or the rest of you know us kids? And I didn't understand at the time that the natural setting for people is actually to help other people. That what he was getting out of it was the joy of helping others not step in the th stuff that he has stepped in. And so at the time and until that moment, I just didn't realize that there are people out there who just want to help and that that's their motivation is just to help. They're not looking for something back. Before that, I, I think I saw the world as, as maybe a darker place, more transactional where you know, everyone's out for themselves. And that's just not how it works. Like I don't live in that world anymore. And that understanding that, that people genuinely want to help because they want to make the world a better place because they get joy from service. In fact, Stephen Collar was just on my podcast and spoke at the Bulletproof Conference. And one of the things that puts you in a flow state is helping other people. So you cannot be the person that you're capable of being with all of your full capacity unless you're in service of other people. That was a big thing to learn. And it was actually Kent's little just willingness to help these kids who clearly didn't have enough experience compared to older, wiser people. But he was putting his time in because of that cause. And I'd never seen that before. Wow, really good lesson right there. And now, scenario for you, Dave. Imagine you had 60 seconds with your 20-year-old self. What would you tell him to do and what would you tell him not to do? Oh, this is a good question. 60 seconds. Uh, let's see. I think I would tell him, eat more fat, dude. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, here, download the Bulletproof Diet infographic because, man, my performance was already pretty good entrepreneurially. If I'd have just had that, Oh my God, it would have been like taking the, the gloves off. I would have also said, here's, here's your, your major three sources of kryptonite in the environment. Avoid this crap and your brain will work. And I would have had another 15 years of high performance versus what I had, which was non-optimal performance. I also would have, would have said, look, you're smart enough to have a, a CPA. You're, you're smart enough to have a doctor. Uh, you should be smart enough to have someone help you on the emotional front. Get therapy work with a, a coach and always go to the best person you can find and afford to help you because you'll get amplified. I believed at that age, I do everything for myself. You know, one man stands alone. <sighs> Are you kidding? I have coaches that help me with everything I can think of. I, I go to the world's experts and I talk to them and then they help me because they also get joy from helping other experts. And if I'd have just understood that, that I, I needed help so I could learn how to have healthy relationships, so I could learn how to manage my emotions, so I could learn how to eat, so I could learn how to do financial planning. I didn't know any of that, and no one who's 20 does, even though you feel like you should. And you don't have to do it all yourself. Very good stuff. And so right now, would you say that you have a mentor for kind of like each area of your life, like your health, your wealth, business, stuff like that? I do, and it's a constantly evolving group of people. I, I have all these amazing like physicians and sports trainers and, and people who know stuff, uh, brain hackers who, uh, who support me. Uh, you know, I, uh, Daniel Amen, uh, 12 years ago, I did a SPECT scan of my brain that showed me I had room for improvement in my brain, which, which was an amazing thing. Oh, look, there's something going on there. I can change that. The power to change your brain a dozen years ago was unheard of. So I can email Dan and he'll email back, you know, like, like where he spoke at my conference. And to have that level of brain expert just there, knowing that that they're there, tons and tons of anti-aging professionals. I also work with Dan Sullivan, who's one of the top entrepreneurial coaches in the country, because I'm growing Bulletproof, and I don't know how to scale my time and attention beyond where I am now. But he does, because he's done it for 40 years. So he's teaching me, and it's not cheap. And so I have this amazing support network of people that I work with, and I spend a ton of money on that. I, I work with Joe Polish on business networking. Joe Polish, his 25K group is $25,000 a year and it's worth every penny because I get to spend time with amazing people and I get to help them and they get to help me. And that's how I met Ariana Huffington and Tim Ferriss and people like that was by consciously spending time with people who are masters of their game. And, and Joe is a marketing master and he's a relationship sort of introduction master. So yeah, I, I have just countless people in my life 
just a few of whom I've, I've named who will help me do little things and big things. And I'm pretty good at what I do anyway, but, but these people amplify me and I amplify them. Wow. Yeah. Really good resources right there. Really good connections to make. And so what advice would you have to someone who wants to have those kind of connections, but you know, maybe they're just starting out and they don't feel like they have that much value. They don't feel like they can offer the same value back to that other person. There's in fact, you're going back to Robert Greene here, (laughs) but there's, there's value in apprenticeship. What I had when I was 16 was the world's biggest ego, which is good. Ego is part of that survival instinct in the body. The problem with big egos is that you don't know what you don't know. So you feel like you're ready to just go do it. And you see a few, you know, extreme outlier cases where, oh, you know, I was 19 and I sold my company for $10 million. Yeah, I was 19 and I got chosen to play in the NBA. But for every one of those, there's like a million who didn't. So what you want to do is is you want to say, how can I add value? Like, I want to learn from you. But if you just say, I want you to be my mentor, you can have a structured mentor program. And some people will do that. And I get requests like that a lot. The problem is that I'm not sure that I know how to handle a, a, a certain mentor like that unless it's like, all right, we're going to work together on a project. So I'd rather have like an apprentice kind of thing where it's a person who says, look, I'm willing to face my fear. I'm, I, I, I'm not fearless. I recognize that I have, I have that, but I'm willing to figure stuff out that I don't know. The vast majority of people, especially when they're younger, have learned behaviors to graduate from school and, and to survive in family and social environments that make them avoid challenges. But what people who are performing well need is I want people in my organization, people around me where I can hand them a project and say, I know you don't know how to do it. I could probably do it better than you because I'm 42 and I've worked for all these companies that have gone public and, and I've been beaten up by executives who know 10 times more than me. But <laughs> I don't have time or focus for that. So I want you to do your best and show it to me and I'll tweak it for you. Showing a willingness to do that, to take risks and to be willing to fail and to be completely, completely non-resistant to feedback. The worst thing you can do in a mentoring or an apprentice relationship, you get feedback and say no and then argue. It's like, it's not that you can't argue. You can make intelligent questions. You can make intelligent decisions. But there are times where I, I've worked with uh, with people who just literally like, okay, you said you do it and you didn't do it. Like, can we talk about that? And like, they just get mad and then they hide. That kind of stuff is very common and it's something that you're doing that you're probably not even aware of. And that is those defense survival things coming up. So if you're going to talk to someone about about being a mentor, uh, you can certainly do that. But come prepared to say, look, I'm willing to be a mentor and I'm looking, I, I want some project I can work on here and I'm willing to do the dirty, unpleasant, hard work. And it probably won't be that much fun, but this is why every apprenticeship in the old days, you want to be a master, you know, master painter or sculptor, you start out with the broom and you get to spend time around people performing at the very best and absorb through osmosis. And there's great value in that. Absolutely. And you really just nailed it. You hit it home with that one and kind of just reflecting back on your life you know, where you were at age 26, $6 million uh, at age 26, spending $300,000 on experiments on your body on different drugs and biohacking and building the bulletproof brand, the coffee, the book, and the things that you've accomplished, like just kind of reflecting back on those things there, like what would you say is your philosophy on life and success? I've never put together a single pithy statement about that. I can tell you that your body is a system you're constantly making a new body and discarding the old one so your body doesn't really exist. It's more like an eddy in a stream than an actual physical thing. Uh, During the course of this podcast, you shed hundreds of thousands of cells and built new ones. So you're constantly changing. You're constantly interacting with your environment and it's interacting with you. So the more you can think of yourself as part of a very big complex system with multiple signaling, the better and stronger you're going to be. You are not a man standing alone, you are an eddy in a stream full of many other eddies. And when you look at it that way, you cannot help but affect the people around you and you can't help but be affected by them. And when you look at the world that way, you have a lot more opportunity, but you have a lot more responsibility. And that's the way I see things. Nicely said and uh, very powerful and to the point. Now that's going to conclude the knowledge on there. So let's go into kind of like what you're working on now, like what's getting you out of bed in the morning besides looking forward to that bulletproof coffee. <laughs> uh, certainly bulletproof coffee helps right now. The bulletproof diet book launch. So this has been a culmination of thousands and thousands and thousands of hours 
and late nights writing this and, and putting my very best learning from those 15 years and $300,000 into, not just into a book, but into a carefully constructed book that tells you how to do it. Because it's so easy to write a bunch of science, but it's too dense. So this is a one-page free infographic. You can just download that now. But I'm really excited by this launch because I think it's going to hit the New York Times list, and that provides an opportunity to help a lot of people. Two of the goals that that get me up every day are that I believe with this kind of knowledge that we can measurably reduce the incidence of autism in the next generation because healthier people make healthier babies, and we can absolutely reduce the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and other chronic degenerative aging diseases. And I say that having run an anti-aging group for a decade. So by by encouraging these practices in this book and by sharing it widely, I, I feel like it does social good far beyond even this generation and far beyond me. Uh, so I, if people resonate with that, go to Amazon, check out the Bulletproof Diet, pick it up, forward your receipt. Uh, you can There's instructions at orderbulletproofdietbook.com and I'll send you a bunch of other free stuff like the poster and, and a, a bunch of videos and all. So this is just a way to share even more knowledge than the publisher would let me put in the book. And I would appreciate that kind of support. I'd, I'd be really grateful for that. All right. I'm excited for the book you have coming out, Dave. And uh, I'm going to put that on my uh, pre-order list right now. And, you know, just thank you so much for spending, you know, this extra time with me here today. Because I, I know this is a longer episode. And for all of you guys listening who, who hung in there and uh, found this episode valuable, I mean, you know, just hats off to Dave for spending extra time with us today. And, um, you know, I'm just you know, really excited to put this one out and I know it's going to go on and impact thousands of people. Andrew, thank you for doing your podcast and best of luck in continuing to grow your already impressive audience. And I appreciate everyone who took their time to listen. All right. That's going to wrap up episode 121 with Dave Asprey.